for accepting this uh, request to discuss the current uh, very critical situation uh, that has emerged since the victory of uh, Modi and BJP for the second time. Uh, uh, I, I definitely, on behalf of the section, I would like to thank you for this uh, uh, accommodation, even though we know you are very busy. Yeah, well, it's a pleasure to uh, discuss with um, fellow socialists and Marxists in the Indo-Pakistan subcontinent, and the events there are not important, uh, not just important for the region and for the country, but it's also important from a world point of view because of the role of India now in the world constellation of forces. Uh, as you know, this victory uh, of Modi and BJP, uh, which uh, happened after a very communal and polarized uh, electioneering campaign, uh, in the backdrop of a uh, in fact, even though it, it is termed as a skirmish, but in fact it was a, uh, it had all the characteristics of a small war uh, between Pakistan and India, uh, and uh, Modi used it to the hill. Yes. So that helped Modi to really increase the vote share, uh, which would have otherwise would have would not have been possible, uh, from 13 percent to last time to 38 percent, yeah. a 7 percent increase in an all India level. Yeah. But apart from that, in the key North Indian states, especially in nine states, nine states, the vote share crossed more than 50 percent. Yes. And even in the bastions of the left, the rightward shift is conspicuous, if not decisive. This is an unprecedented mandate. Uh, in the history of independent India. Yeah. The question that I would like uh, you to uh, look at and answer in the context of above situation that I just explained, is it right to say that India has been taken over by, by far-right politics, which very much in line with the trend elsewhere in the world that is happening right now? Well, there is a certain uh, parallel with what is happening in Europe with the electoral success of uh, far-right populist uh, parties, but it's not exactly the same. It's for the special circumstances that exist, in our opinion, in uh, India. And moreover, it's really a triumph of hope over the experience of the Modi government in its first period in power because it's failed even according to its own lights in terms of poverty, of eliminating poverty in terms of economic development and, and really no solution of the accumulated problems of India which has been there for generations and Modi offered a new path, a new turn and so on. And as you say, there's an element in this election of the personal power of Modi and the illusions in Modi they're trying for a temporary historical period, but in my opinion will not lead to a drastic change in the situation. It certainly is not a triumph politically and socially for the far-right policies that he's put forward because it's against the background in India, in, in Asia, and so on, and the world of all the intractable problems of capitalism inherited from the previous period which are now going to be compounded by the onset of a world economic crisis in the next period that will particularly impact on what we would call the neo-colonial world, on the economic developed areas of the world, which is what India still is, and as a result of that, this will be a temporary historical moment, a moment in history that will not have the far-reaching consequences, either that Modi believes is the case, which will allow him to consolidate his re regime, nor will it allow, well, nor will it bear out the very pessimistic conclusions of many other people, really, on the left even, where they've seen the bastions of the left, as you pointed out, falling under the spell of Modi and of Modiism and the seeming Hindu wave, 
This is a temporary phenomenon. The, the key question is the working class can be thrown back by this. The, Ameri the, uh, the Indian ruling class, the landlords and the capitalists can go on the offensive, but it will lead to a recall. We have to remember in the relatively recent event, history of India, we've had massive general strikes. And that will be on the agenda of the workers' movement in the next period. Yeah, the, I mean, in the context of what is happening at the moment, Modi uh, and his uh, cohorts are uh, preparing for a, a new period. In fact, uh, uh, BJP and Modi call this the new India. Uh, uh, and also they boast, uh, like their uh, counterparts elsewhere, uh, they say that uh, 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 this parliamentary democracy is about to complete 75 years of existence in India and uh, both the ruling classes here and elsewhere, they try to uh, show this, showcase this as the best example of democracy as a stable institution. Uh, but of course, they often compare this with Pakistan, Bangladesh, and even to Sri Lanka, and pronounce that Indian democracy is stable, uh, at least in electoral terms, in the uh, in the current situation. And Modi, uh, as you said, the Modism, what is uh, in India called as Moditwa, uh, is going to usher in a new India of unseen progress and uh, unheard of success. Well, okay. So, in that context, how stable is India's democracy? As long as the social democratic staff are far from being completed, especially when at least 40 percent, uh, in fact it is more than that, of India's 1.34 billion yes. languishing in absolute poverty, yeah. is it not right to say that the instability is built into the very edifice of India and the bourgeois capitalist rule? Yes, and really India uh, what, 50, uh, you know, tens of years after independence, uh, 1947 till today, in a favorable period economically in the 1950s, and a relatively favorable period of a recovery from the crisis of 2007-8, in the period when Modi's been in power, this has been a relatively favorable position, but the, the essence of the matter is, despite the electoral fireworks, that Modi happens to have um, sparked in relation to the last election. Despite that, the, the fact is that the fundamental problems, not of socialism, not of the, the kind of living standards we think is possible on the basis of a democratic socialist planned reduction, but on the basis of the bourgeois themselves, the bourgeois democratic revolution has not even been completed in India, which is really a thoroughgoing land reform and land to the tillers of a certain development economically. Yes, a development is taking place, but it's very spasmodic. There are islands of development, which is in a, in a sea of poverty and uh, economic uh, stagnation and so on. And that will not change. And now there's an element, because he was able to use the conflict in relation to Pakistan and give a favorable image of what India represents at the present time. But there's a large element of Bonapartism that always has been in the situation. That is the, the personal power of Modi and of the government. The government seems to have concentrated enormous power in its hands. Modi himself seems to have concentrated enormous power with a so-called clean image throughout the whole of India. But all of that is done is to concentrate all opposition forces on the government and on Modi himself. And therefore, there will be colossal upheavals, not just in India, but of course throughout the neo-colonial world and in Asia, and in the advanced industrial countries. I mean, we have the phenomena of Modi in other countries. For instance, we had it in Brazil, with the colossal economic developments that took place in the course of the last uh, period up to the crisis of 2007, 2008. And now Brazil is mired in backwardness and we had the return of Bolsonaro 
with his uh, mad ideas of uh, autarky for, for Brazil, of identity politics, of dividing the working class, and the consequence is that there will be an enormous radicalization, and there's a radicalization will inevitably take place, and it will be compounded by the onset of a new world economic crisis. So this does not represent, this represents a high point for Modi, for the Hindu nationalism, and so on. And all the forces of opposition will move into gear in the next period. Uh, he, uh, Peter, in our uh, pre-election material in the last couple of months and even a year, we have uh, said that uh, Congress, uh, the, the earlier party uh, of the big bourgeois, uh, Congress is in a terminal decline, which unfortunately is proving to be correct at the moment. Yeah. We in the past argued that the left is trying to take its place as the B team, uh, take the place of Congress as the B team of social democracy. But then, the recent trend in the last few years, particularly since 2011, when the Communist Party lost West Bengal, yes. goes to show that left too is uh, irrecoverable from its long-drawn debt, yes. especially as it is clinging on to its uh, old shibboleths of uh, uh, there is no alternative to capitalism, progressive bourgeois theory, less liberalism, etc., etc. Yeah. With this, with this situation, what international examples that can throw light and are comparable to the current Indian situation that can show a way forward for the regeneration of the left in general and for the genuine Marxist force, uh, forces in particular? Yes, well, I'm asking this question in the context of complete desire among the left. Uh, has, the uh, has the possibilities for a revolution thrown back for an unforeseen period? Is it a period of reaction engulfing the continent or India at least? No, I don't think it is a period of reaction. In fact, as I've said, that Modi is plowing the ground and his, his whole actions while he's been in power and others as well, including the actions of the Congress party, have plowed the ground and there have been more than one opportunity for the working people, that's the, the working class, and the poor peasants to take power at least on a state level in India. That's in a period when there were powerful communist parties with the potential to mobilize the masses, as you've mentioned in West Bengal. But one of the phenomena is that because of the theoretical and political decay of the communist parties, really, of Stalinism, who were looking for, solution, for a solution within the context of capitalism. Now we had the phenomena where in West Bengal, I believe, that the communist party, some of the communist party cadres went over to the BJP as a means of security for themselves. And now the task in India is to recreate new workers' parties probably on the state level to begin with, and the opportunities will be there. Because one thing is certain, given the character of Indian capitalism, and given the character of the working class, working people, and the poor peasants will inevitably resist the onslaught of naked capitalism. And we need to repeat, the bourgeois in the West, the capitalists in the West, are terrified politically of the coming economic situation that is likely to, de to develop. They've already discussed how we can put in place a political alternative that can siphon away the anger of the masses in some kind of new social democratic left variant. For instance, for, like Roosevelt in the US in the 1930s, where you have the Financial Times predicting that there will be inevitably social explosions they used the phrase the other day of the tumbrils of the French Revolution beginning to be mobilized to, to, to frighten the bourgeois. And we had, the, of course, the, the example in the US of uh, the, the ruling class should be afraid of the, uh, of the inevitable uprising of the American working class. That's why elements of socialism, at least, are appearing in the program of the left in the USA. 
Now that's happening in an advanced industrial country. In the neo-colonial world, where the economic situation is much more tenuous, where capitalism does not have a real future, despite the fireworks that appear to have taken place, in the next period it will be a, pe a stormy period of upheaval. I've got no doubt that the masses will fight. They've got no alternative but to fight against the deterioration in their conditions. The key question is, will they have a party and a leadership in power or a leadership that, that can be built that can develop the potential to lead them in struggle? And you mentioned the development of left parties elsewhere. Well, we have the ferment in the US at the present time in the so-called left of the Democratic Party. That offers really, doesn't offer a lasting solution to the problems of working people. People like Bernie Sanders should break from the Democratic Party and form a workers' party. We've had in Europe, remember, alongside of the new right-wing populist parties, we've had the turmoil within the Labour Party in Britain over Brexit. There's not so much a split in the ruling class in Britain. There's a splintering in the ruling class with the Tory party, which is the most successful electoral machine in Western Europe in history, is now in the process of meltdown with uh, up to now 11 candidates for the vacant Tory party leadership. That is a symptom of the underlying crisis of British capitalism. At the moment, the masses don't appear to be moving, but they will. They have moved, for instance, in the Corbyn, in the Corbyn phenomena that at the moment is, is stalled because of this problem of Brexit. Or, for instance, of Podemos in uh, Spain. That also is stalled because it moved towards the right. We need new mass workers' parties, but we need them of a special kind, not to immediately then begin to look for an opportunist uh, way out. And that means that the socialists and the Marxists of India and of the whole subcontinent have to raise this question of new mass parties of the working class and engage in this. Whether that comes with a new party or whether it comes, for instance, in an upheaval in the, the communist parties, what remains of them, and a nucleus out of that can be formed, that's the way the working class will move in the next period. It's not a question of wishful thinking. It's not a question of us saying, well, we hope that this will develop. It will develop. It's not dogmatism on our part. We've seen it in the recent period. It's now a little bit in a, in a, uh, in a blind alley, but this is a temporary phase. It will be uh, changed on the basis of big events, big movements of the working class, and particularly of the new generation that will fight against all the limitations and all the evils of capitalism in the advanced industrial countries, but it's a catastrophe for the masses in the neo-colonial world, which includes India. Uh, Peter, many liberals, like elsewhere, many liberals and academics in India argue that seeing the situation through class prism will take the left slash Marxist nowhere. Uh, though they attribute this form to the CP that, but hardly any time in history the Communist parties have had an idea of class perspective. They argue, the uh, liberals and academics argue, that I, India is a country of various identities. Hence, it is important that we pursue community politics. This is nothing but identity politics in a different name. Yes. They want us to believe that the class antagonism doesn't exist. Instead, it is gender, caste, language, region, nationality, etc. While we can't reject the existence of these horrid realities, born out of the incapacity of the bourgeois land or classes in developing society, but at the same time, making any concession to these identity argu arguments is like a self-goal or a hit wicket. So the question is, so what would be the program? Uh, 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 a transitional one at that, that will pay way for clarification of this complex scenario thrown at us. One from the failure of the bourgeoisie, second, the pernicious uh, legacy of Stalinism and Maoism internationally 
as well as in India. Well, that's a very good point because um, it's not for the first time in history that the theoreticians of the bourgeois have attempted to conjure away the class struggle. They had a certain basis for these arguments in the period that I've lived through in the 1950s when we had the greatest boom in history roughly from 1950 to 1975 when the wealth of the world quadrupled of the advanced industrial countries increased four times over when even the working class got concessions of the very rich table of capitalism and real living standards increased. That came to an end in the crisis of 1975 and since then we have had an oscillation between ever deeper and longer crises and brief periods of prosperity when the previous economic situation was not, re not to restore. Now that's the best situation that capitalism has been in. And inevitably, it's not a question of agitation or of propaganda. It's not for us. We don't base ourselves just on the idea of calling for a class program or of agitating to change society. It's an objective reality. The class struggle takes place irrespective of the class warriors, irrespective of Marxists or of Trotskyists. It takes place, it would take place if we weren't there. What we do is we give it a program a perspective and the necessary tactics in order to mobilize the power of the working people and then of course to use that power to affect the change in society so they can spill as many words as they like India is a class ridden society as is Britain as is the rest of the world now what the bourgeois have tried to do in the last period and not just in the uh, neo-colonial world but throughout the capitalist world, including in Britain, is the curse of identity politics. It's to try and con convince, which is really a another device, particularly out of the universities of the USA, which are kind of ideological factories of the world bourgeoisie. In these factories, they've concocted these theories of um, identity politics, where the starting point is what differs what difference there is between working people and not what unites them. Identity is very important. The struggle against racism is very important. The struggle against women's oppression for uh, LGBT uh, plus uh, liberation. All of those things are important. But, but the difference between us and the proponents of identity politics, we fight for all of these oppressed sections of society, but we link it to the unity of the working class in struggle. Because only the working class, by unifying all the movements together and fighting to change society, can actually solve the problems of the most oppressed layers in society. That applies to caste, for instance, in the Indian subcontinent itself, which is a terrible uh, you know, legacy of the underdevelopment of India and, and really the fact that it's, it's not yet moved on to the road of modernity, which it can't, while it's controlled by the iron hoops of capitalism. So our task is to free the working class from all, I, all alien ideas, which prevents them from uti uniting against the common enemy, which is the capitalists and so on. I mean, we, we, we recognize, for instance, in India, that the bourgeois democratic revolution is not being carried through. For instance, the, the right of self-determination is a crucial demand for India, because India really is made up of a series of nationalities and of subgroups as well. Within those nationalities, wherefore satisfying all those demands? But it cannot be completed. It will not be won on the basis of capitalism. It's only on the basis of a socialist confederation of the Indian subcontinent, beginning with India itself, that you can satisfy the right of self-determination of all the oppressed minor minorities of the oppressed castes and so on and abolish casteism and open up a new modern uh, which we would say would be a socialist uh, society that's the only way forward for India the question is how do we get there and I would uh, emphasize the need for class organizations fight against this attempt what is communalism 
except another form of a division amongst working people. The only way is to unify the working class through the trade unions. That's the most important unifying organization. And revolutionary mass parties which unify the working class in action. Uh, Peter, I mean, you did touch upon the question of the, uh, the crucial question of national question. Uh, as you said, still one of the most complex issues that faces the region is of national question. Given the rightward shift, not just in economic sphere, but also in the social aspects, in fact, Modi could win this second term not because of his scoring performance in the economic sphere, but in spite of the dismal failure there. Yes. He used jingoism and warmongering nationalism to sway the voters. Given the deep divisions in the society uh, and the animosity against Pakistan and Islam, and with the scenario of a full-scale war, though it can be very dreadful but cannot be ruled out. And another factor that needs to be counted in is the question of the alienation of the upper caste. Modi may inadvertently fuel the balkanization of the country. Is it not, uh, it is not the, this jingoist state of events is a new phenomenon. Previous regime of Congress have tried this, but as traditional bourgeois representative, uh, representatives, they knew the danger too, uh, that it can cause, especially in a country of, uh, of such diverse population. BJP's guiding ideology and its mantra of Hindu Rashtra, that is Hindu nation, this victory or the mandate gives a different narrative to nationalism. Earlier under Congress, post-independence India's nationalism was rhetorically anti-imperialist, but BJP has a different meaning. It's fundamentally anti-minorities advocating one nation, one religion. Yes. So in this background, has India, has Indian state reached the point where balkanization is seriously posed? Well, you could not rule it out, but it's, uh, it would, would not necessarily just develop uh, immediately in one act. But nevertheless, you've put your finger on the problem of the BJP and why it will compound the problems of India. Because India is made up of, of nations. In fact, as you know from your history, at the time of the uh, occupation of British imperialism, it actually, India was not a, a nation in the classical sense of the, the term as we understand it today. It was made up of different nationalities. And even after independence, the obvious division between Hindu and uh, Muslim, which the British encouraged, and which then at the time of independence criminally assisted in the uh, partition of the country and so on, all of those leg legacies of the economic underdevelopment of India and the cultural and social underdevelopment are, are, have been inherited by the very weak Indian uh, ruling class today. And the idea that you can you can suppress a huge uh, minority of the, of the Muslims. I mean, if I'm not mistaken, there are as many Muslims, if not more, in India than there is in uh, Pakistan. And then to, okay. at the same time, to, um, to, 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 to be involved in persecution of the Muslims, which inevitably will trigger upheavals with Pakistan, including a new war, as you said. Now, actually, this is the element of Bonapartism in Modi, where he, he, he can stoke up nationalist uh, sentiments, a safety valve against Pakistan, an anti-Muslim situation that could get out of hand and could result in a new war. And who knows where that can end. Out of a war, by the way, it's no accident that war has been often been the midwife of revolution. It's not just the, the question of aggrandizement on behalf of this power or that power. Out of a, a war, particularly a failed war, where there's a defeat. That's what happened in 1905 in Russia with the Japanese-Russian uh, war. Uh, and it could happen in the case of uh, India or of Pakistan, uh, of a provoked war which goes wrong and then the, re the political repercussions can compose the question of revolution. But I have to stress the precondition 
for us, uh, abolishing feudalism, and abolishing all the heritages of the pre-capitalist uh, regimes, which is holding in the Abad, with all the discrimination against minorities and so on, no right of self-determination, all of them are a danger to India and a danger to the, the Indian subcontinent, and the only force that's capable of leading the nation or completing the bourgeois democratic tasks, which is the unification of particular entities, Pakistan in the, in the, in the current case, India in the other, or of complete right of self-determination for those nations who believe that they are oppressed by the greater Indian state, uh, we, are, or, we, are, we, we, we inevitably raise that as part of our uh, program. All of those, uh, those demands are, are, are essential, but they need to be linked to the idea of fundamentally changing the political situation through the development of a mass workers, pro workers organization. Then, of course, the question of the program is posed in that respect. Um, last uh, question, uh, Comrade Peter. I mean, as you know, BJP and the RSS, appro uh, their approach is based on the arithmetic of caste, religion, region, language, and gender. This is because, you know, with this, the opposition also falls into the same trap, including to a very great extent even the CP left in one way or the other. This is because uh, behind its one Hindu nation slogan, it can hoodwink all these identities that I mentioned. But what BJP and RSS fears most is the eruption of anger at the, uh, at the deep class divisions in society. Behind its facade of Hindutva lies its desire to have a Hindu bloc without class divisions where it can hide its real nature, its own class interest, that of capitalism. Yes. Again, because of casteism, or the vestige of feudalism, in fact it is more than a vestige, this is more overwhelming in fact, which has never, which has never consciously fought, which has been never consciously fought, fought by the bourgeois, instead the bourgeoisie for their own narrow ends have nurtured it very in various ways, and even their piecemeal solution of reservation, that is positive discrimination, have not even touched the surface, <coughs> let alone solve it. But now, the monster of casteism has itself become a stumbling block for a united struggle against capitalism and landlordism. Identity politics, as you mentioned, of all kinds, is festering to the advantage of reactionary forces. You did mention the question of trade unions, the question of uh, the way to fight, to the, how to uh, the, the, the kind of uh, door through which we will fight this and the unify the class. But uh, uh, on the ground, the ground reality is even the section, great numbers of the uh, trade union uh, who are in struggle are also infected by class divisions in the society. The poison of casteism is there. So we cannot overlook that. In that situation, what is the transitional approach program in such an imbroglio of a situation in relation to caste and class because it is overlapping vice versa. Yeah, well, you've, again, uh, we are implacably imposed to all forms of discrimination and divisions within the working class and the caste system and casteism is obviously a terrible blight on the, the, the labor movement and the working class movement of India and is an obstacle to the, to the fusing, fusing the different aspects of the struggle in a common struggle against landlordism and capitalism. And there's no shortcuts here. I mean, we, there's a problem now in the, un, in the developed world, in Britain and elsewhere, we have the problem of racism, which is uh, a searing problem in Britain, for instance, in the USA, the legacy of slavery and so on. We've had it in Britain and we've, I've given examples on the previous interviews I've done with you about the way that we approach this in relation to the situation here in Britain. 
where we uh, organized an organ a, a movement called the Panthers, the UK, which was linked with fusing together different uh, sections of black youth and Asian youth into a very powerful movement where Bobby Seale came over here and participated in the activities of that uh, situation. And we even went to the extent in Liverpool where the council there had a very progressive um, employment policy which took on thousands of young black workers uh, with the agreement and the support of the trade unions and done in, a, in an even-handed way which got the support of the whole of the workforce. So the demands, of the, the transitional program will vary or the transitional demands will vary depending upon the concrete situation. But our starting point, is, I repeat, is to oppose all divisions in the working class, to fight for the unity of the working class, and how that's put forward in a concrete situation, that has to be worked out on the ground. You can't do that from a distance. You have to have an understanding of the movement, of how it's developing, and so on. And I'm confident that in the next period in India, despite M Modi, and because of Modi, because of the provocations of the Modi government and the regime, and that element of Bonapartism, which is like personal power, it's kind of uh, making the government stand above the contending forces in the parliament and in society, it's possible that on the basis of, of Mo Modi blundering in this situation, which he inevitably will, will, will do, that there will be opportunities for a socialist and a Marxist force to make inroads, inroads particularly into the new generation and to imbue them with a class and a socialist alternative and an opposition to all programs and measures that seek to divide the working class and emphasize the interests of one section as opposed to another. For instance, in the US, it used to be called sectional politics. Right from the beginning, there was a history of that. In Britain, that, there was also a sectional struggle before the development of industry. But what did capitalism do? Capitalism unified the working class in big industry. That's the whole essence of capitalism. And the, the necessary collective consciousness of the working class developed through big industry. Small, isolated workshops, a scattered consciousness can develop. Even there, based upon experience, the masses can come together through trade unions and fight for an alternative. That's the future for India. Let those communalists and those sectarians fight for a different road. They will build on sand. They won't build a sustained movement which is capable of seriously challenging landlordism and capitalism in India, throughout Asia, and indeed throughout the world. Th thank you, Peter. I mean, that was indeed uh, the clarification that you gave on very uh, important point was like a beacon of light. I think uh, uh, we will be, uh, will be, we will do things in a more confident way, of course, as I said. Not that ourselves, but the entire left is in a disarray. And uh, hopefully this uh, video will also go outside of our ranks through YouTube and other social media and uh, we will, uh, uh, we will uh, gain uh, more strength and also start uh, the organization against, not only against the Modi's regime, but uh, the capitalism itself. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Jagadish. Bye.